Go ahead, open up to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We are launching a new series today, so if this is your first time here, it was a great time to come as we kick off this series in Ephesians. Now, a series is called Identity Crisis uh, for two reasons. First of all, it's because many of us face an identity crisis. What I mean by that is uh, we are asking the most basic questions of ourselves and really of our lives, right? Who am I? What gives my life meaning or significance or purpose, right? I mean, these are the deepest questions, and many of us are, are wrestling, searching for these sorts of answers. So we're all experiencing this kind of identity crisis. And Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians to answer just that question. Here is who you are. Here is specifically who you are in Christ, right? That's what we're going to look at this morning in particular, is our identity in Christ for those of us who believe. So, uh, as we get going, if you ever studied psychology, high school, college, or something like that, you probably came across the curious case of Clive Waring at some point. Clive Waring, who uh, suffers from anterograde amnesia. All right, so uh, here's what this means. So he contracted in a form of encephalitis as an adult, and unfortunately this disease uh, attacked his hippocampus which is the part of your brain that, among other things, transfers your short-term to your long-term memories. Okay, so everything you're experiencing right now is in your short-term memory, and then, and then it goes away very quickly, unless it gets transferred to your long-term memory. So if next week you remember any of this story, it's because your hippocampus is working well, right? It's doing what it's supposed to be, and now it's in your long-term memory. Well, uh, Clive Waring no longer has that ability. Okay, that doesn't happen. That transfer doesn't happen anymore, which means he's really incapable of forming any new, lasting memories. So what this means practically in his life is that his life restarts basically every 7 to 30 seconds. Every 7 to 30 seconds, he thinks that he has just woken up from a coma and that this is the first time he's been awake in years. All right, so if his wife were to walk into the room, as, as she often does, he would greet her as enthusiastically as you've ever seen somebody greet their wife, right? Because he doesn't think he's seen her in years. And if she were to walk out and walk in again, she would get the same greeting over and over and over again. Now, this is how many of us live spiritually, right? How many of us live spiritually? Because we are constantly forgetting who we are in Christ, Right? So uh, a big part of our identity crisis as Christians is really just spiritual amnesia. Can't quite remember who we are, what God has done for us, how the gospel shapes our identity, which again is that really the central theme of Ephesians. So this is really great teaching, right? I mean, what Paul's writing here in Ephesians is so important, but... The problem is none of that teaching matters if we keep forgetting it, right? If we keep forgetting it. So here's kind of our central idea, not just for today, but really for our whole series, is remember who you are in Christ. Remember who you are in Christ. But the thing is, that means we got to keep taking ourselves back to these truths. About every 7 to 30 seconds. That sounds right, doesn't it? Like, it's pretty easy to forget who you are in Christ. Let me give you an example. So, we just got through the holidays, and if you come from a, a family, basically, you know that holidays can be stressful times, right? You know, there, there, there's that long chain that gets yanked with families, and so people can push buttons very easily. And so, you know, maybe you're going there, and, and you've been praying on your way there, and you're going, okay, I'm not going to regress to being a 16-year-old with my parents. I'm not going to regress to being a 16 right? You know, I've got this going in my mind, and then mom or dad or older brother or in-laws or somebody makes some crack, and it's all gone, right? completely forget who I am in Christ, and I am, a, you know, a spiritual infant again, or something like that. And so, what do we got to do? Got to remember who we are in Christ. Got to call these truths to mind. Got to consider them actively, ponder them, meditate on them, preach them to ourselves. Here's the way Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, British preacher of the last century, uh, put it. He says this, he says, Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself, right? Which is a little paradox, but it's a question of whether you're passive or active in terms of the conversation that's going on in your head. He goes on, he says, the main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. 
You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. You must turn on yourself, upbraid yourself, condemn yourself, exhort yourself. And then you must go on to remind yourself. Remind yourself of God, who God is, and what God is, and what God has done, and what God has pledged himself to do. All right, that's remember who you are in Christ actively. And this is what Paul is writing to encourage. So, hey, let's just read the introduction here. All right, so Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's writing to the church in Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey, west coast of modern-day Turkey. And he's writing them because they face overwhelming discouragement. Uh, so it's been seven years since he's seen them. He, he is ministering in Ephesus for a good period of time, actually. If you were here with us last year, it was just under a year ago that we got to Acts chapter 19 when Paul is ministering in Ephesus. If your hippocampus is working especially well, that was the sermon where I, I made all the different kinds of tea. Yeah, okay. So a few of you, it's good. It's all right if you don't remember, not a problem. But uh, so that's where we were. That's when Paul was in Ephesus. He's there for a period of time, but then he leaves. And now it's been seven years. And Paul spent the last two of those years imprisoned, which is kind of the end of the book of Acts. He's in Rome when he writes this, but it's still under, under guard, right, at this point. So they're discouraged that he's in prison, and they're discouraged that he's not ministering to them anymore. And they're discouraged because life, the Christian life, is a little bit harder than they thought it was going to be. They're facing temptation as well, especially the temptation to assimilate to the culture around them. Right? Because that's what happens when you get persecuted. When, when people are mocking you for your faith, it's easy to kind of go, you know what, if I blend in a bit more, I'm not going to get persecuted. And so that's what's happening here. And the church is divided. It's not like they all met in one building, right? Because there weren't really big buildings back then. So the, the church in Ephesus is, is a group of different house churches. And these house churches were taking on their own identity. And especially you had the Jewish Christian house churches, and then the Gentile Christian house churches. And these two are getting farther and farther apart, so the body of Christ is is divided. Part of that's because uh, the Jewish Christians, if they acted more like Jews, they escaped persecution. And and so they kind of did that and distanced themselves from the Gentiles, who are going, well, then fine, we don't want anything to do with you. And so they kind of went further this way, and they're tempted to assimilate more towards uh, their pagan neighbors yet still persecuted, and also finding themselves increasingly unintelligible to the culture around them. That is, uh, the people that they're trying to witness to, to evangelize, are going, I don't even understand what you are. Uh, You're not Jewish, but then you're not a pagan, so, so what exactly are you? And this is the discouragement that they face. And so Paul writes them knowing that they need to remember, right? They need a reminder of the power and grace of God. They need to remember uh, the place of the church in God's plan, universal plan, right? And they need to remember their ethical responsibility. What does it look like to live as a Christian? And he's going to hit all of these in the letter, and we'll hit them all in our series. But we start at the beginning, of course. Now, let me ask you this. Do you ever feel discouraged as a Christian? Ever feel divided from any of your brothers and sisters in Christ? A little something between you? Ever feel tempted to assimilate to the culture around you? Act a little bit more like those who aren't Christians that you know? Welcome to Ephesus, right? Welcome to Ephesus. You need the same reminder. We need the same reminder. And this is what Paul offers in this opening valley of praise with which he begins his letter and especially the the core of it, right? What do we need to remember most? We need to remember who we are in Christ. Look what he says, verse 3, right? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Who are we in Christ? We're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, what does that look like? He, he unpacks that phrase in the rest of this opening uh, long sentence. It's divided up into a couple paragraphs for us, but this is a single sentence of, of praise in, in Paul's Greek. So he unpacks it. He says, here's what it means, that you're blessed with every spiritual blessing. It means you're, you're chosen. It means you're redeemed. It means that you're sealed. 
And let's look at each of those in turn. So, uh, first of all, remember who you are in Christ. You are chosen. Chosen. Uh, Ephesians 1, verses 4 to 6. Let me read it for you. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. You notice that this uh, next sentence begins with the word for, right? For. In other words, he's giving the proof. He's giving the explanation of how we've been blessed in every spiritual blessing in Christ. Again, he's unpacking this for us. Here's what I mean, that you're blessed. First of all, he chose you, right? And so that's that's key piece of our identity that we have to remember. I am chosen. If I'm in Christ, I am chosen. And not only that, I was chosen before the creation of the world, which is crazy, because I didn't exist then, right? What does that mean, then, practically? If I was chosen before the creation of the world, it means that this had nothing to do with me, right? There's nothing that I did to deserve this, because he chose me before I did anything. So this was not about my effort, No, his choice, his love for me is grounded in his character, not my character. Thank God, because my character is iffy at best, right? I mean, I I mess up a lot. Don't know about you, but I'll throw myself under the bus at least. I, I mess up a lot, but God's ultimate acceptance of me is not conditional upon my behavior, but upon him and him alone, his unchanging character. Thank God, right? Now, whenever we speak like this, right, whenever we speak of what theologians call unconditional election, election means choosing, unconditional means, again, nothing I have to do, right, because this is, this is what God has done for me. Whenever we talk about unconditional election, there's this immediate objection that comes up, right? And it's this, if I'm accepted because of him and not my actions— Well, then why change my actions? Why act any differently? Why change my lifestyle? And so there's this fear, right, that unconditional election will uh, turn into a license for sin. We can just keep doing what we've always done because, hey, it's up to him. It's not up to me. Paul's too smart for that nonsense. He's having none of it, right? And so he goes on, right? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be to be something, right? There's a purpose for our election. What is it? To be holy and blameless in his sight. So he chooses us, but he chooses us to make us something new. What that means is if God really chose you, he will change you. He will change you. Another way to to put it, I guess, is if he saved you, he's actually going to save you right? Like, it's going to be a complete salvation. He's not just going to snatch you from the hellfires, but he's actually going to fit you for heaven, make you the sort of person who will enjoy his presence forever. We have this promise throughout Scripture. Uh, Paul, again, Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. He's going to finish the job. 1 Thessalonians 5, right? Uh, Paul says, may the God of peace sanctify you, make you holy, blameless, right? Sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who called you, chose you, is faithful, and he will do it. He's going to change you. Or Peter says that we are chosen, uses the same word, right? Chosen through the sanctifying power of the Spirit, So the the agent of our choosing is also the agent of our transformation. We will be changed. If he saved you, he will actually save you. Here's the way Richard Baxter, a Puritan preacher, put it. He's kind of saying, all right, if God really chose you, you know, if he saved you, what, what happens? Well, if God cannot save you, he's not God, right? If he lacks the power to transform your life, well, then he's not God, right? And if he will not save you, well, he has to break his covenant. Right? Because you've chosen in Christ. He's promised to do this. Neither one of those things sounds like God, which means if he saves you, he's going to save you. You'll be holy and blameless in his sight. Part of what it means to be chosen. He goes on, though, right? And he kind of says, the next thing you've got to remember, I'm chosen, but what is the nature of that choosing? I am adopted. I am adopted, in love, no less, right? In love, he predestined us for adoption. And this is in love because, remember, it's, it's his character. Not my character, his character. This, so this is, this is how I've been chosen. 
the, the type of choosing that God has uh, done for us. He's predestined us. That's unconditional election again, right? Predestined us for adoption to sonship. Now, when I say sonship, about half of you go, can I be adopted to daughtership instead? Right? And the answer is no. All right? But here's why. It's not uh, sexism, and it's not because, um, you know, we're all going to be male at the end of time or something like that. No. This has everything to do with inheritance rights. Okay? So we want the inheritance, every blessing in Christ and, and inheritance at this time, in this culture, the analogy that Paul's using, the inheritance went to sons. Right? Went to sons. And so adoption had everything to do with the passing on of the inheritance. Julius Caesar, for example, has no kids, doesn't have a son, so he adopts uh, Octavius Caesar as his son. Why? Octavius was already a grown man. He, this wasn't a, a love thing, you know, or anything like that. No, this was just so that, that somebody could inherit Caesar's wealth. It ended up being the Roman Empire, you know, so a decent inheritance, right? And that's it. And so Octavius Caesar, Caesar Augustus is how we know him today. That's how this works. And so that's what's happening here. Now, there's a little bit of a difference, though, of course. First of all, this is in love. So this is more than just inheritance, right? But the other thing, of course, is God has a son. God has a son, right? There is already somebody who is inheriting all this. His name is Jesus. And yet it's in him that we are adopted as sons. Well, here's why. If you have uh, infinite riches of glory and grace, uh, that's better than the Roman Empire even, right? So you might as well spread this around. Hebrews says uh, he wants to bring many sons to glory, right? He, he wants to lavish these riches on us. And so that's it. Everything is ours in Christ because we are adopted as his sons be able to receive the fullness of this inheritance to the praise of his glorious grace, Paul says. And of course it's to the praise of his grace, because again, what have I done so far to deserve any of this? Nothing. Absolutely. The only thing I've contributed to this equation is the sin that he has to save me from. And yet there he is, to the praise of his grace. Now think of how profoundly remembering our adoption should touch our hearts. I heard this story um, a few years ago in a Reader's Digest, but uh, just a short story that kind of captures this nightly, nicely. It was um, There was a mom, uh, and her daughter had just had a, a newborn baby. So you got three generations, right? Newborn baby boy. And so um, the daughter's holding her, her newborn uh, and, and looking at him and going, this is a little weird. He doesn't really look like either one of us. He's got a darker complexion and darker hair. You know, I just, I wonder where he gets this from. You know, my husband's light-skinned, light-haired. I'm light-skinned, light-haired, and whatnot. And, and mom, the, the grandma, is going, no, he's, he's got your daddy's hair, right? He's got your, your daddy's complexion. That's all this is. You know, this is how genes work. And, and the daughter looked at her mom and said, but mom, I'm adopted. And the mom said, oh, right, I always forget. Right? That's the strength of adoptive love. There's just a sense of, but you're mine. You're mine completely. Right? There's none of this, no, you're not really my kid. You know, remember that. You're not, we're not actually, no, it's going, you're every bit as much mine as a biological child would be. Now, here's how this connects. What about uh, us, right? When, when we're in Christ, when God has adopted us like this, I don't think it's blasphemous to say this. I hope not. If so, you can stone me later. But <laughs> when we're in Christ, God forgets that we weren't always his. Right? It's a willful forgetting. It's not like he's absent-minded. No, a willful forgetting that we weren't always his. He loves us as much as if we were Christ himself. That's the strength of his unrelenting love. But my question for us, of course, is what about us? Do we forget the strength of his unrelenting love? Because I think it's very easy for us to forget just how dearly God loves us, especially when things get hard. We can immediately start thinking, he forgot about me. He doesn't remember me. He doesn't care about me. He's taking no notice of me. This is how kids work, right? Those of you who had kids, especially pushing into the teenage years and stuff, will occasionally think, my parents don't love me. Right? It's obvious that they wouldn't be treating me the way they're treating me if they actually loved me at all. And the parents are thinking to themselves, really? 
I mean, like, have you seen what I've done for you? Just, you know, like, fed you and clothed you, roof over your head. I've driven you to three different places every day for the last 12 years of my life. But no, you're right. I don't love you at all. Completely forgotten that, that you exist, right? Even in the face of tangible expressions of love, just proof of love, we can still forget. And what about God? We can forget, right? And here's the thing, though. We were adopted, it says, through Jesus Christ. What does that mean, through Jesus Christ? That means that right there, the cross, right? That's what it cost for God to adopt us, which means the tangible proof of his love is always there for us. We never have to question it because it's written across history at Calvary. He loves us. He loves us. And look, here's the thing. If he doesn't forget how much he loves us, we can't forget how much he loves us. Don't be a spiritual Clive, right? Don't forget. You are chosen. Preach that to yourself. See what it does to your feelings of self-pity. Watch them dissipate like clouds in the face of it, right? You feeling unloved? We feel that way sometimes, right? Are you feeling unloved? Yeah, but he, he chose you. He adopted you. He loves you always and unchangeably. Are you feeling unworthy? Sure, and probably for good reason. We're not worthy of this love. But you've been made worthy. You've been adopted, and you are now loved and esteemed as God loves and esteems Christ. That's not the end of it, though. That's just the first part. I'm chosen. Next, I am redeemed. If I'm in Christ, I am redeemed. Verses 7 to 10, let me read them. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. I am redeemed. Now, what does it mean to be redeemed? This is a, a religious word, right? We don't use it anywhere else, so we don't actually know what it means anymore. Let me give you a little illustration. It's been around for decades. There's a good chance you've actually heard this before, but this is what redemption looks like. So there was a, a young boy who had spent all winter making a model ship. Okay, a model boat for himself, like an actually seaworthy boat. And so uh, when he finished it, it was beautiful. I mean, just gorgeous craftsmanship. When he took it out, then when spring rolled around, the lake thawed and all that, took it out so that he could actually put it on the lake and, and you know, watch the thing go. And it went, all right? Wind caught the sails and out into the middle of the lake. Lost it, right? Couldn't get it. Spent the next few days and weeks walking uh, the edge of this very large lake, trying to find it in the hopes that it would have washed up on shore somewhere, but never, never found it. Until one day he was walking in town, and what should he see in the shopkeeper's window except his beautiful boat there on display for sale? So he goes into the shopkeeper and says, that's my boat. I have my boat back. And the shopkeeper says, no. I don't know that it's your boat. All I know is I bought it from a fisherman who found it. And so here's the price. And what did the kid do? Well, he worked his tail off all summer long to be able to earn enough money to buy his boat back. That's what it means to be redeemed, right? To buy something back again, right? And so as he was walking out the shop with the boat, he said, you are twice mine because I made you and then I bought you. And that's who we are in Christ. It's a very similar story, right? Made by God and yet lost. Not because the wind caught us. This wasn't accidental, but because we ran away, right? Rejected him willfully, sold ourselves into slavery to sin. And it's from that slavery that we are bought back, repurchased by Christ. So you can see then why the slavery to sin piece, why, why Paul immediately says, in him we have redemption through his blood. Let me explain what redemption means. The forgiveness of sins, right? That has to happen. If we're going to restore this relationship, you're going to be brought back into this relationship, you've got to deal with what fractured the relationship in the first place, and that's sin. Sin. So we need a, a legal forgiveness, right? We need somebody to, to deal with the offenses, to wipe the slate clean, so to speak. We also need a, a relational forgiveness to be, to be brought back into this relationship with him. This is the way Isaiah puts it. Isaiah 44, 22, you can see both ideas. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist, right? It's gone, 
right? The, the legal piece of it, it's taken care of. Well, what happens next then? Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Come back into this relationship, okay? I bought you back. I've taken care of all of that. Now, how does this happen? It's not just a simple declaration, right? God doesn't just get up and go, that's it, I forgive you. That's not how justice works. We wouldn't have that. You know, if somebody walks into an airport and starts shooting the place up, we don't want a judge to just go, it's fine, no big deal, carry on with your life. No, there, there needs to be a, a reckoning. There needs to be justice. We long for it in history. I don't know why we ever expect anything less of God. So, so something needs to happen. Justice needs to happen. How does it happen? Well, in him we have redemption through his blood, through Christ's blood. And justice is done at the cross because our sin is punished in him. The punishment for our sins is placed on Christ instead of us so that we can experience the wonder of his forgiveness. That's why Paul says that he's lavished his grace on us. This is the lavishing right there in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. Now that phrase, in accordance with, that's an interesting phrase. Because when we give, even if we're wealthy, when we give, we tend to give from our riches, not in accordance with our riches, according to our riches. Let me explain the difference here. So you walk by somebody on the street who's begging, you throw a buck or two into their cup. Has your lifestyle changed at all? You have to downsize your house, take out a second mortgage, sell the car? No, you're giving from your riches, right? And the same thing happens with those who are tremendously wealthy, and you know, they're giving a million bucks to, to put in a wing on a hospital or something like that. Lifestyle hasn't changed. Might have to share a helicopter with the neighbors, you know, but this is not a big deal. That's from your riches. But now imagine that same person, fabulously wealthy, the kind of person who can write million dollar checks for hospitals, walking up to somebody on the street who's begging and saying, here are the keys to the house. You come on in whenever you need to. You're part of the family now. In fact, here's the credit card. Okay, now be careful with the credit card. There's a $10 million daily spending limit. So just try and keep it under that. But you're one of us now. That would be giving according to riches, right? According to riches. That's the way God has redeemed us. That's the grace that he has lavished on us. But he doesn't stop there. He keeps lavishing on us. And here's the next part of what we have is not just uh, redeemed, but also made aware, enlightened, let in, okay? Because he says, I I'm going to reveal the mystery of my will to you. God has revealed his plan. What that means is that we, as Christians, if we're in Christ, we know how the story is going to end. We know how the story is going to end. We know that he's going to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Christ is going to be king, and we get to live under his glorious reign. The unity that's coming is the unity between the, the created order and redeemed humanity, right? Those, those two come together. That's, that's Revelation 21 and 22. That's the new heavens and the new earth and this new Jerusalem that we will live in. That's the unity that we're going to experience under Christ, now, there's a little bit of a translation issue here. In fact, if you're reading in a different translation, you may have punctuation in a different place than I do. That is, should we read, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us along with all wisdom and understanding, period, he made known to us? Or did he, uh, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us, period, and then he, in all wisdom and understanding, made known to us the mystery of his will? could go either way, that phrase. Here's the nice thing. It doesn't really matter. We end up in exactly the same place. Because either way you slice it, wherever you put the period, you end up with the same thing. God is infinitely wise, and that wisdom gets passed on to us. We get to, to know what this is. We get to grow in discernment because we know how the story ends. Here's what this means. So uh, here's a quote from G.N. Clark, who was a Cambridge professor uh, a while ago. This is in his inaugural lecture at Cambridge. He said this, There is no secret and no plan in history to be discovered. I do not believe that any future consummation, that's also Revelation 21 and 22 that he's talking about, right? That's the end of the story. I do not believe that any future consummation could make sense of the irrationalities of the preceding ages. Very pessimistic outlook, right? History makes no sense. It's going nowhere. Quit looking for a reason. And Paul's saying to us, no need for that pessimism. Okay? If we are in Christ, 
we know that history is going somewhere, that all of this will make sense someday in Christ. We have the confidence, in other words, in Christ, that if we knew what God knew, we would choose as he chose. History would unfold as it has. I don't understand how. I'm not claiming to know that, not by any means. But I have the confidence that when we get to the end of the story, we will go, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Here's the thing, though. Don't be a spiritual Clive. Don't forget this, right? You are redeemed. You're struggling with guilt, shame, your past. Yeah, but you're forgiven if you're in Christ. Your, your sins have been swept away like clouds or mist. He bought you back, right? You're not sitting there in the shopkeeper's window going, nobody's ever going to want me. If you knew what I'd done, if you'd been where I've been, nobody's ever going to want to buy No, he, he bought you back. And not at the cost of a summer's worth of work, but at the cost of the blood of his son. You're forgiven. You struggle with doubt, fear, hopelessness when you read the news each day. The one who redeemed us, he holds history in his nail-scarred hands. It's going to be okay. We know how it ends. But there's still more. Last section. I'm in Christ. I am sealed. Sealed. Verses 11 to 14. Let me read. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who are the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. All right, we've got to explain this a little bit. Now, remember, the Ephesian church is divided between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And so, in this last section, Paul turns to each group and addresses them. Okay, so when he says, we, he's speaking as a Jewish Christian, because Paul was a Jew, right? And that's verses 11 and 12. And then, in verses 13 and 14, he switches to you. There he's addressing the Gentile Christians, who were brought into God's family later. So, look, part of the unity that God is going to bring when he brings all things together under Christ is a, is a unity um, of racial and religious background, which uh, these, this is a big problem, right? And you look around in the world today, how many of the conflicts are religious or racial in nature? A lot, right? I mean, most of them. And they're often confused, right? Is the conflict between Palestine and Israel religious or racial? Yes, right? I mean, there's this connection here. But that, that's going to be brought to an end. It is already being brought to an end in the church to the praise of his glory. Now, let me address each group here. So, verses 11 and 12 are particularly good news for those of you who grew up in a religious home, in a religious environment. You've been coming to this church for the last 50 years. This is for you, okay? This is what we're talking about. And what does Paul say? It's interesting. It says, in him, we were also chosen. Why is that such important news if you grew up in a religious background? Because if you've been religious your whole life, it's really easy to forget that you were chosen. You can begin to think, this is because of me. Look at the life that I've led. It makes sense that God actually loves me. If you haven't been rescued from a deep darkness, in other words, Right? If there's not that, that glaring sin in your life, you know how other people sin, your neighbors and things like that? You don't have that. I mean, yeah, you messed up, but not, not like that. It's easy to think, I'm here because of what I have done. And Paul says, in him, you were also chosen. This has nothing to do with your character. This has everything to do with his character. Chosen before the creation of the world. Chosen before you had done any of this. This is all of grace. Then in verses 13 and 14, he says, let me talk to the other group, right? And so that's for those of you here, and I'm in this group, who did not grow up in a religious home, who were rescued out of the deep darkness. Very real sin in your life that you can point to. And Paul says, here's what you need to remember. You need to remember that you are now included in Christ. You are included in Christ. Your identity is now in Christ. It's not in your past. It's in what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. You are a member of his body, welcomed into his family, part of the temple. 
a, a piece of, of his treasured possession. In other words, if you're in Christ, you belong. You belong, right? Belong, not because of your merit, but belong because you belong to Christ. And there's no one more welcomed in God's presence than Christ. And this belonging, this is even better news, this belonging is assured. There's no possibility of getting kicked out of this family, getting kicked out of, you know, of being a part of God's treasured possession because we are sealed with the Holy Spirit who's received at conversion. This is a deposit, Paul says, a down payment, a guarantee. The rest is coming, okay? Because we don't experience the, the fullness of the riches of God's grace. We won't until glory, until heaven, right? But this is the guarantee. This is the earnest money, right? You give earnest money when you buy a house. Why? Because you're saying, the other couple hundred thousand dollars I owe you, it's coming. It's coming for sure. And that's what the Holy Spirit is in our life. It's a, it's a taste of the future consummation. Now, I've got to be careful here, of course, because, again, it's really easy for us to hear this and go, great, so it doesn't matter what I do. I can live as I, as, however I want to live, and, and I'm never getting kicked out of this family. No, 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 because if you were chosen, he will transform you, right? He, he, you're going to be holy and blameless in his sight. And if you're not holy and you're not blameless, if that isn't happening in increasing measure in your life, you should ask yourself some really hard questions. You were probably not saved. You're not saved, because if he saved you, he's going to save you, right? If he saved you, he's going to save you. Otherwise, he's not God, or he's got to break his covenant, and neither one of those is true. If he saved you, he's going to save you. Now, Peter says that this inheritance is kept in heaven for us. That's what I mean by it's guaranteed, right? It's kept in heaven for us. But here, what, what Paul is saying, really, is that we're kept in the Spirit for it, like we're going to come together at the end, though, the riches of this grace, which means this provides me with an assurance that I otherwise couldn't have. Because if, if my being saved were dependent on me, I could never be sure. I could never be sure. Now, how could I possibly stack up my good and my bad and go, yeah, I know I'm in the black. I'm going to be in the black at the end of time. I, I, I couldn't have that insurance. In fact, I had this conversation just last week with someone who doesn't believe you know, and we were talking quite a bit about heaven, and she said, yeah, you know, well, I can't possibly know, but I think I'm going to get there. Ugh. The burden that that would be in your life. I know. I know where I'm going. And here's why. Because it's not me. If it were, I couldn't know. But no, it's about Christ and what he's done for me. And I'm absolutely certain about that. I'm assured. Right? I, I, I know I'm going to get there because I'm in Christ, and he's already there. I'm already there. That's what that means. But here's the thing. Don't be a spiritual Clive. Don't forget this, right? If you're in Christ, you are sealed. You're feeling lonely, isolated, divided. You belong. You're included in Christ, a part of God's family. Are you struggling? with sin, as we often do. You keep stumbling, you know, you wake up, you're praying day after day after day, God, change my heart. I don't want to do this anymore. And then you do it again. You're sealed. You are sealed. You will cross the line, not because you're good enough or strong enough, because neither one of those is true, because he will carry you there. And all of this is to the praise of his glory. It's how Paul starts, it's how Paul ends. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the very last phrase, to the praise of his glory. And we gotta keep this in mind when we talk about who we are in Christ. Gotta remember, this whole story isn't about us. It's not about who I am. No, it's, it's about who he is. Not about me, but about the display of his infinite worth in my life, which is pretty cool, because that raises my life above, above the mundane, right? What this means, if I'm in Christ, I have the greatest purpose on earth, to magnify the glory of God. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, first question says, what's the chief end of humanity? What's our main purpose? The answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's all that, right? 
That's all that. I mean, how could you not experience infinite joy in, in light of all of this? And how would that not be to the praise of his glory? So don't forget. Don't be a spiritual Clive. If you are in Christ, you are chosen, redeemed, sealed. Now, I've got to say a word here to those of you who may be with us this morning who are not in Christ. There are some here who are questioning Christianity, I'm sure. Here because you're investigating the claims of Christ, or here because somebody dragged you here, but still really unsure about all of this. What we're talking about this morning, I mean, these are the, the deep, deep longings of every human heart to belong, to be completely known and yet completely loved still, to have the past dealt with. I mean, this is what we are all longing for. And here's the thing. It's found in one place and one place only. Right? I mean, this is what your identity can be in Christ. Because you will find... No message like this anywhere else. You can search the religions of the world. You can search secular philosophy. Nothing is like the grace that is offered in Christ. Here and here alone will you find this. And here's the thing, to where we're taking communion today. I mean, what is this? What, what is communion? It's everything we're talking about, right? For those of us who believe this is the memorial, this is the remembrance, this is the, as I take the bread and I take the cup, I go, I'm chosen, I'm redeemed, and I'm sealed by the blood of Christ. And every month when we do communion, I say at one point, this is a family meal. This is for those of us who are in Christ, where identity is found in Christ. And if that's not you, let the bread and the cup pass you by. But I always follow that up with this reminder. This could be the first time you take it, right? So this is a call to remember for those of us who believe, but this is an, an invitation to believe for those of you who don't yet. Let today be the day. There's nothing holding us back. Trust in the finished work of Christ. Let grace have its way in you. And this is the identity that you are given the very greatest news we could ever know. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this truth. Thank you for this remembrance, the memory that so often fades in our minds, just how deeply you loved us and what that love means for us, for our future, for our transformation, uh, for the fellowship we can know in this life, for the glory that is to come in the next. Help us, Lord, not just to remember now, but to call this to mind over and over and over again in our lives. Let us not forget. Let us preach this good news to ourselves. And I pray, Lord, for those who are here who have never yet believed. I pray that you would work a mighty work in them this morning and that these truths that we have shared would become true of them as they confess their sin against you, as they repent, as they turn from the life they have lived and embrace the life that you offer, the forgiveness you offer in Christ. Teach us grace anew, Lord, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen.